Well, I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, you're listening to the Naked Scientist podcast. I'm Katie Haler, and this is the show that brings you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology, and medicine. And over the past few weeks, we've been musing over the science of movement from enormous planetary scales to tiny cellular ones. And so this week, to celebrate our devotion to motion, we bring you a move a We'll be talking exercise, how animals get about, the wanderings of our early human ancestors, the movements under our feet with a superstar panel of scientists answering some of the science questions you've been sending in. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. So let's introduce our panel. We have Dan Gordon, Paralympian and exercise physiologist from Anglia Ruskin University. Dan, I hear you've got a bit of a plan to get our blood pumping later on. I thought that very short little exercise treat for everybody just to get them raring to go, get the brain cells going, yes. How easy is it to teach sports science virtually? Because, I mean, it's by definition quite a physical discipline. It's been a real challenge. We've had to opt for having some of the sessions are face-to-face. So, you know, our practical sessions are still having to be face-to-face if the students are able to do it. So we've adopted kind of a blended learning approach. It's certainly forced us to think about different ways that we are doing this practical, particularly where we're collecting respiratory air and respiratory gases, which are, in essence, aerosol generating. Ah, ah, yeah, I see the problem. We've also got Cambridge University archaeologist Emma Pomeroy. And Cambridge University has been in the news recently, hasn't it, Emma, because of the news about Darwin's missing notebooks. Have you heard about this? Yes, I have. And um, really quite, you know, a a big story and quite shocking. They're such important um, notebooks. But there have been other cases where similar manuscripts have gone missing and turned up later. So I just hope that'll be the end of this story. We might draw some parallels with the illegal trade in antiquities, for example. And while something like this would clearly be very high profile, I'm sure there are private markets out there just as there are for valuable archaeological artefacts um, where people would still pay an awful lot of money and um, buy them sort of on the quiet. So, yeah, sadly so. Also on the panel today is Eleanor Drinkwater, longtime friend of the show and our go-to animal, well, in fact, creepy crawly expert. You've been doing your PhD on woodlice personalities and I always love having you on the show because we get to talk (laughs) about how cute woodlice are. How's it going? Yeah, it's going really, really well. Uh, Woodlice personality is one of the most fascinating things on the planet. So next time you see a woodlice, you know, watch it for a little while and see whether you can figure out whether it's friendly or or shy or, or bold or not. See, my problem is I've got two cats now and I'm not sure a woodlouse would survive in my garden for very long. I don't want to say that to a woodlouse expert, but I think that might be the case. Well, they're probably much better at hiding than you expect. So you've probably got some healthy populations going on there. Don't worry. (laughs) Oh, okay. So I've selected for athletic woodlice. I get it. (laughs) And we've also got volcano and earthquake scientist Jess Johnson from the University of East Anglia. Jess, has the pandemic restricted any of your fieldwork? Because you usually like to go to Hawaii and do lots of cool science, don't you? Yes, it has. Unfortunately, Um, I had a trip to Hawaii books last year and um, or earlier in the year rather we've had various trips to the Caribbean as well had having to be cancelled um, but luckily we can still get quite a lot of our data so we're still working away. Excellent glad to hear it this is our superstar panel so stay tuned for a lot of movement science and some listener questions. Let's kick off by considering the creepy crawly world of insect movement, first of all. And on our Animals on the Move show, we heard how biosecurity expert Simon McCurdy surveyed a cruise ship floating near an Australian island with a unique ecosystem. Simon was looking for stowaway insects that could pose a threat to the biodiversity of the area. And one critter proved extremely difficult to remove from the boat an insect called Tribolium destructor, a tiny little beetle. We're only talking, you know, a beetle of about five millimetres in length. But despite all the effort we put into hunting for this beetle and baiting and trapping and chemical treatments, 
even at the, the end of the 19 months when that vessel sailed away, we had not managed to kill the population. We were still finding larvae on the last few days before it left. Eleanor, the insects on this boat uh, were moving not under their own steam, as it were, because this was a cruise liner coming from the Baltic to Australia. But how do insects fare in terms of moving great distances under their own steam? This is such a great question. There are a few different kind of long distance insects that we know about. So, for example, there's a very famous, very flashy monarch butterfly, um, which they, they do travel pretty long distances. However, their distances are completely shot out of the water by a creature that very few people has heard of. So there is an incredible dragonfly, which is known as the globe skimmer or the wandering glider. This is a very small creature. So it's only about two inches long and about three inches across its wingspan. And unusually for dragonflies, it is it has these incredible long distance migration. So they have developed enlarged hind wings that allows them to glide for incredible distances. In fact, they do this migration from East Africa to India and then back again. Wow. Which is, yes, exactly. And so which is a distance of, you know, around about 18,000 kilometers, which is just mind blowing. This is multi-generational. So you get different individuals who do different legs of the journey. But even the individuals themselves go extraordinary distances. So, for example, there is one stretch in which they have to cross the Indian Ocean, and which is a distance of 3,500 kilometers, that individual insects that are no longer than two inches managed to do, which is just extraordinary. Eleanor, it puts my wa- uh, lunchtime walker on the block to shame a little bit. But we were talking about Australia earlier. And this year, we've seen some enormous wildfires across n- numerous parts of the world. And I was just wondering how in general animal movement can relate to extreme conditions like fires. The obvious thing is is a lot of animals, insects, are great at hiding from fires. So during the hot season, they'll kind of hide themselves in kind of cracks and crevices. But what I find even more interesting is you get some insects who travel long distances towards the fires. So in fact, some species like the black fire beetle, it needs fire in order to reproduce. So they they use their their sense of smell um, in order to detect fires which are which are long distances away in order to be able to lay their eggs in recently burned wood and their larvae can only develop if it has been grown in a, a piece of wood that has been recently burned and the fascinating thing is many of these animals are actually becoming quite rare because of better fire management that we have these days. That sounds like quite a tricky one from a biodiversity conservation point of view because you know there's massive amounts of animals that have perished in these wildfires but on the other hand you've got animals who actually require fire is that quite a difficult balancing act yes it is it's really interesting because you get it's not just these individuals who do very very well or need it to breed but if you think about an area which has been burnt suddenly there's no competition and there's kind of very high nutrients in the soil and also slightly raised temperatures so there are certain species that do really well in these conditions um, to the detriment of, of, of other individuals. So kind of recently burnt areas are quite interesting from that point of view. But you're totally right that it does come at, at a big cost of a lot of other species. So it's a very difficult kind of balancing act. Eleanor Drinkwater, thank you very much. Now, on the subject of movement, let's turn our attention to some very relevant fast-moving science. Around the world, scientists are tirelessly working towards various COVID vaccines. We've heard recently about various candidates, including the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and now news is out of the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine, whose, quote, Phase 3 interim analysis, including 131 COVID-19 cases, indicates that the vaccine is 70.4% effective when combining data from two dosing regimens. Gillis O'Brien Tier is from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine, and he's going to help us digest some of these recent announcements and what they actually mean. Gillis, first of all, how does this vaccine actually work? The vaccine works by introducing DNA, which sends a message into the cells to make the spike protein from the coronavirus. Now, in order to get into the cells, Oxford virus sends the 
vaccine in using a vector, a carrying, if you like, a Trojan horse, which is in fact an inactivated virus which cannot replicate in the human body. It's sort of a weakened version of a common cold virus called adenovirus. Once the um, virus carries the DNA into the host cell, the human cells, the cells, our, our own body cells, start making, on the instruction of that DNA, the spike protein of the coronavirus. And the body then mounts an immune response to that spike protein. And the reason that disables the virus or prevents the virus from infecting uh, the person who received the vaccine is because the spike protein is what the virus uses to get into our bodies. Who have they tested this vaccine on? Does it protect people who are actually most at risk? So far, they've announced results of three phases of trials. The phase one trial, the phase two trial, which was published last week in the Lancet, peer-reviewed journal in great detail, 560 participants in that trial, half of whom received the vaccine. And more recently, they announced the interim results from the larger phase three trial, which has enrolled 24,000 people, half of whom received vaccine, half of whom received a control vaccine for meningitis, as it happens. So in total, they've, they've enrolled tens of thousands of people, and they plan to enroll up to 60,000 people all over the world. And you ask whether they've en enrolled people who are at high risk. The phase two result, in that study, they enrolled people who were older, over 70, as well as younger people. And in the phase three trial, they've also enrolled people who are older. And because they've done the study all over the world, they've also enrolled a lot of people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And as we know, the black and minority ethnic population are at higher risk from coronavirus and elderly people are more at risk. That's well known. So they've made sure they've included in the trial those groups of patients. And encouragingly, from the phase two results, we saw that the immune responses which the recipients of the vaccine mounted against the coronavirus were just as strong in the elderly people who were in the trial, over 70s, as in the younger ones. And that's significant because it's well known that older people have a weaker immune system than younger people. Is this about preventing infection or mitigating the consequences of getting COVID? The interim phase three results have shown both. It's been shown that it prevents COVID symptomatic illness in up to 90% of patients, depending on the doses used. But also it prevents severe illness because no cases of severe illness were seen in the patients who received the COVID vaccine. How safe is it? The phase two results have got very detailed safety data and show the vaccine produces the normal side effects that most immunizations or vaccinations cause. A sore arm, sometimes a fever for a day or two and a headache, which can all be treated with a paracetamol. So it seems to be safe. There'd be no serious adverse events reported on this trial. So how well does this work? What's going on with these different response rates and different dosing regimens? Well, they enroll patients at two different doses, a half dose followed by a full dose. And then another group received two full doses. Slightly counterintuitively, they saw 90% efficacy in the first group who received a, low, a half dose followed by a full dose and a lower efficacy of 62% in the, in the patients who received two full doses. Now, vaccines are not like regular medicines where the higher the dose generally, the higher the effect. And there may be one or two scientific reasons why this happened, but they're looking into that currently. But the important point is that even at the high dose, high dose regimen, they achieved very, very good efficacy. Because if you remember, flu vaccination only vaccinates against 50% of cases. So it cleared the hurdle for an effective vaccine. And at the lower dose regime, it was 90% as effective as any other vaccines that have so far announced results. What are the theories on why this half dose followed by a full dose seems to be better than full dose followed by full dose? One theory is that the body can mount an immune response to the vector. And if that's the case, then it can reduce the efficacy of the vaccine because its, its carrier is attacked by the body. Now, it's possible that the low dose regime provoked a less brisk immune response to the vector uh, than the high dose, high dose regimen. And that's one possible explanation. But they're still looking into this. There could be other explanations. AstraZeneca have said that the study was not initially designed to look at the lower dose and that there was possibly some mishap gave the patients a lower dose than they intended to. But first of all, a very large subgroup of patients did receive this lower dose. So it's a robust sample. And secondly, it probably doesn't matter in terms of the approval and the efficacy of this agent because they've shown that it works very effectively 
and the regulators may choose to approve that lower dose because it's been shown to be more effective. We really await more results from the full publication and from AstraZeneca about what happened, exactly what happened. Is it a fair question to ask you how this stacks up compared to other COVID vaccines in the making, or is it a bit too soon to be talking about that? It is too soon in the sense that all of these, the three announcements we've had from three different programmes are all based on interim data, which is not the full data set. So the, the numbers may change. However, I'd like to talk about the difference between efficacy on a clinical trial in a very controlled setting and effectiveness in stopping the pandemic. They're two different things. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine costs $3.00. It's very easy to transport and it's got very good efficacy, even the blended efficacy rate of 70 percent. That is an extremely good efficacy rate. So even if it's got a slightly lower efficacy rate in clinical trials, doesn't mean that it's going to be less effective in containing the pandemic because it's easier to get around the world. We need to stop this pandemic in all parts of the world, not just the Western world. So the fact that it's cheaper and easier to transport might mean that in the real world, it's the more effective vaccine, if you can understand that slight paradox. What questions remain then? Because so far we haven't had a vaccine that's actually been approved by the regulators. Well, we anticipate regulatory approval before Christmas for at least two of these. I I, I would imagine at least an emergency use authorization in the US for one or more of the messenger RNA vaccines. And the UK authorities are going to rapidly review the UK Oxford vaccine. They'll They'll be also reviewing the messenger RNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. I think it's a very low probability they will not get approved. They will go through the the proper review process, though, looking at all the data. And secondly, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we've got unanswered questions about efficacy and safety. We need to see the full data set. For example, how effective is the Oxford vaccine in the elderly? We, We know from the phase two results that the elderly have brisk immune responses. But does that translate into effectiveness, efficacy in the big phase three trial? So there are a few unanswered questions still while we wait for the full results. You know, nine months ago, we didn't even know if we could vaccinate against coronaviruses because we tried with MERS and SARS-1 and failed. And here we are nine months later, not only do we know we can vaccinate effectively, but in, in nine months, we've got phase three trials of multi tens of thousands of patients enrolled and we're nearing regulatory approval. It's an unprecedented achievement. It's very exciting, isn't it? Gillis O'Brien here. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Naked Gaming Podcast with me, Chris Barrow. And me, Lee Milner. Every month we look at the latest gaming news. This is definitely the kind of study that should have probably been done, you know, 10, 20 or 30 years ago. We review the biggest releases. So start up the game on your Switch, connect to your cart, and you're ready to go. And because there's a simulator for almost anything, we play some of the strangest ones available. Okay, so my options are drink a good whiskey, go out and enjoy a hot night, go out and get some fresh air. Let's go with drink a good whiskey. The Naked Gaming Podcast from The Naked Scientists. Download it now wherever you get your podcasts. Today, we're reflecting on our month of movement science shows with a special movement-themed Q&A. Coming up, new findings uncovered in ancient Pompeii, and a fitness challenge to get those muscles working. Stay tuned. Now, we heard earlier about wildfires, and on the subject of extreme events, with us is volcano and earthquake expert Jess Johnson. Here in the UK, where we're recording, volcanoes may seem like an exotic aspect of a far-off land, and we don't often see the impact of substantial earthquakes. That's because of where the UK's positioned on the plates, or the cracked bits of the Earth's crust floating around underneath us, on the planet's molten mantle. There's plates being made and destroyed, so where the ocean is being made is at a mid-ocean ridge. The big mountain range you see in the Atlantic, on maps of the Atlantic, that's where plate is being produced. And then where plate is destroyed uh, is in these subduction zones. So you see that in the Pacific Ring of Fire, this big uh, ring of subduction zones where ocean plate sinks back into the earth and destroys it. As the plate sinks into the mantle, it pulls plates along with it. And so essentially the, the continents float around and they're being pulled and pushed by the ocean plate as it's being made and destroyed. And that's essentially how the plates move. That was Hannah Sophia Davies from the University of Lisbon from our Earth on the Move show, giving us a bit of a Geology 101. 
Jess, how do these dramatic events like volcanoes and earthquakes relate to the concept of Earth's plates? As we've just heard, um, the Earth has a thin crust on the outside, which is uh, what we live on. And that crust is split up into plates and we call these tectonic plates and they move around on the surface of the Earth. They do move slowly, but in some places they're moving apart, some places they're moving together and some places they're moving side to side. At the boundaries between the plates, that's where we're likely to get earthquakes and volcanoes. So where they move apart, pressure is released from the material underneath. And as it moves to fill the gap, that's where we get volcanoes. Where the plates move together, one plate often gets pushed beneath the other one and the underlying plate releases water as it's squeezed and the water travels up through the under overlying plate, uh, melts the material and in turn that causes volcanoes there. Um, that third type of boundary though, where the plates move side to side, we don't often get volcanoes, but we do get large earthquakes. Earthquakes are usually caused when there's a relative movement between two plates and that causes the rock to crack. Uh, they can be any size. They can be really tiny um, that we won't even feel. But the, the big earthquakes that we hear about happen at these destructive plate boundaries, the subduction zones that you just heard about. And these are called mega thrusts. Where are these? Where in the world are we talking about? They happen at the boundaries between plates. Um, so we, we heard in that clip the ring of fire. Um, so that goes all the way around the Pacific because the Pacific plate is bounded by all of these other plates that are kind of moving relative to that plate. Through the middle of the Atlantic, there's a plate boundary. There's a sort of newish one coming through Africa. Um, but the UK is, is quite safe in the middle of one of these plates. We don't get very many earthquakes and we don't have any volcanoes. However, earthquakes can happen everywhere. It's not only at the plate boundaries that they happen. Um, and often when earthquakes happen away from these plate boundaries, it's caused by old stresses. So stresses from where we used to be on a plate boundary, or even when the glaciers that used to cover the UK have melted, the plate is kind of rebounding slowly. And the stresses as that's moving uh, can cause small earthquakes. So how good are scientists at predicting where a quake might happen and what the impact is likely to be? Well, we're not very good at predicting earthquakes. Um, they don't give us much warning. We can tell quite a lot. We can tell where an earthquake is likely to happen. Um, over long periods, we can tell which areas are likely to have more earthquakes. And we can say how big the biggest earthquakes are likely to be. Um, but the actual trigger for large earthquakes is a bit of a random process. So telling exactly when an earthquake will occur is impossible at the moment. We do model the impact of large earthquakes, though, so we can tell where earthquakes are likely to happen, just not when. And um, we can tell from past earthquakes, we can look at current plate movement, and then we can assess what the shaking is likely to be. And we have to look at other things like where people live, what sort of buildings they're in, to look at the impact that an earthquake might have. What about volcanoes? Because, I mean, I assume it's pretty obvious where a volcano is. Uh, yeah, most of the time. Yeah, we're a bit better at forecasting volcanic eruptions, mainly because they give us more warning. We know where volcanoes are. We measure gases coming out of the ground. We measure deformation of the ground when the magma reservoirs pressurise. And we also measure small earthquakes that are caused by magma breaking through the rock as it makes its way to the surface. So all of these clues tell us when a volcano is getting ready to erupt. Of course, we need lots of monitoring equipment on the ground to gather all of the, those data. But even then, it might do something unexpected. Um, about half of the time when a volcano looks like it's about to erupt, it doesn't. What is your research about at the moment? My main research uses those small earthquakes around volcanoes to track the stresses in the rocks and fluids under the ground. Uh, at the moment, I'm working with data from the eruption in Hawaii in 2018 that people may have heard about. There were over 50,000 small earthquakes over about three months that accompanied that eruption. I take the earthquake waves and measure them, and um, earthquake waves can actually be polarised in the same way that light can be. So because all rocks have these microscopic cracks in them, if you put pressure on a rock, the, the cracks, some of them close, some of them open, and they kind of all line up 
And that means that earthquake waves will travel faster in one direction than the other. And that polarizes the earthquake wave. So I use that polarization to map the pressures and the fluids underground. I'm also involved in uh, some other projects that work with communities that live with natural hazards every day to mitigate and reduce the risks that they live with. Currently working with people in Dominica, in the Caribbean, um, and the idea is to create sustainable solutions to monitoring the hazards and reducing the risk. Thanks very much, Jess. We'll come back to you in a minute because we want to talk about a particular volcanic eruption. We're now going to head over to Emma. You're our archaeologist and I wanted to bring you in here because one of the remarkable examples of volcano eruptions has to be Pompeii, right? The Roman city that was destroyed by the eruption of volcanic Mount Vesuvius about 2000 years ago. Pompeii is particularly interesting because the volcanic ash ended up preserving the remains of the city and many of its inhabitants, providing a rich resource for, well, for people like Emma, archaeologists and scientists today. And actually, recently, the preserved remains of two more people have been unearthed in Pompeii Archaeological Park. Emma, what have they found? So what they found, uh, the remains of two individuals, as you said, um, they're two men. One seems to be older, perhaps between 30 and 40, and the other one younger, so in his late teens or early 20s. Now, what they've actually found is, if you like, the void left behind by these men's bodies when they were covered in ash. And then the bodies rotted away. The bones are still there. And so what they do when they find these voids is pour in the material to take a cast of that hollow. By doing that, they can then see the actual shape of those people's bodies. And Jess, how does a volcanic eruption end up freezing a city in time like this? Well, one of the most deadly hazards from a volcanic eruption is called a pyroclastic density current. Uh, So this is kind of like a a flow like an avalanche, but it's made up of volcanic ash and boulders combined with deadly gases, all at thousands of degrees and travelling at hundreds of kilometres an hour. So very large pyroclastic density currents can create tens of metres of ash deposits. And in Pompeii, Mount Vesuvius had a large eruption, creating these pyroclastic density currents. In this case, probably the the temperature likely killed the residents of Pompeii instantly, but then they were very quickly buried in the ash, as was the entire city. And so that is what preserved them. Emma, what information can actually be gleaned from findings like this about, well, about things like what life was like for people in this ancient city? A great deal. I mean, what's exciting about these individuals is, like I said, you've got the skeleton within these casts that they've been able to produce as well. So not only can we see the skeletal remains um, and analyse them to look at things like age at death, whether individuals were male or female, and aspects of their life. So were they healthy? Did they suffer arthritis? All these kind of questions. But then because we've got sort of the casts of their bodies as well, we can look at other things like what were they wearing? And in this case, the older man was was wearing um, a woolen cloak, it looks like. And we can perhaps look at things that we can't tell very easily from the skeleton, what people's build and physique was like. And then you've got all the other evidence that gets preserved. So there's really remarkable sort of everyday objects that come from um, Pompeii, including things like wooden furniture and the remains of food still in the bowls on tables in some cases. It's really a whole host of evidence that actually usually we don't get preserved in the archaeological record. Now, Jess and Emma, I want to put this to you because on our forum, Peter's been wondering about volcanic ash. He says the excavation of Pompeii must remove enormous quantities of this ash. So how what do you do with it? How do you dispose of it? He reckons it might have a purpose as a soil improver. Emma, you probably deal with them um, moving dirt and things around as an archaeologist. What happens to the stuff? That's such a good question. And I'm actually really intrigued to know now what happens with the material from Pompeii. Um, So usually in an excavation, we're usually removing just normal soil and sediment. And typically, unless the things that we're excavating are going to be left exposed for display, such as at um, Santorini or Pompeii, we actually fill back in the hole that we've excavated, partly to make it safe in some cases, sometimes because there's going to be new building work that takes place uh, 
over the top, or sometimes perhaps to protect the remains that we have found for future generations. So quite often we actually put the material back. It's also important to remember that many archaeological excavations are not on the kind of scale that we're seeing at Pompeii. You know, it's really an amazing project that's been going on for such a long time. So that's a brilliant question. And actually, in the case of Pompeii, I don't know and would love to know. For the moment, Emma Pomeroy and Jess Johnson, thank you very much. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for your audio and video productions. We're rounding off our month of all things movement by answering your questions today with a bunch of science movement maestros. On the way... We discuss what links footballers with an increased risk of dementia. Now today, the day this podcast has been published, is Giving Tuesday. And we'd especially like to thank those people who have kindly helped us out by making donations this last week. They are Michael, Carol, Danny, Robert, Adam, Ranjit, Jody, Mario, Greg, Richard, Nick, Roland, Neil and William. This makes a massive difference to us and it helps to keep the show on the road. So please, if you enjoy this programme, do mark Giving Tuesday by supporting us. Go to thenakedscientist.com slash donate. Every little helps. And if you can become a regular donor, we'd be especially grateful. Now, it's time to get the blood pumping here in the studio and perhaps with you at home with a bit of movement of our own. Dan Gordon still on the line. You're our exercise expert. Can you inject us with a little bit of uh, motivation and movement? Because we've been sitting down for a while. We have. If we've got space, stand up. All I'm going to ask everybody to do is, I was the chief timekeeper, for 30 seconds, just do squat. Hands on your hips or hands on your head. And just try and do them as as fast as you possibly can. We just want to get the blood pumping a little bit. Are you going to do them with us, Dan? I'm going to do them. Don't you worry. Okay. (laughs) Right. Is everyone ready? Is ready? Here we go. In three, two, one, let's go. I'll practice my, uh, I don't know about my technique actually. Never mind. Nice and steady. I'm trying to do nice, relatively deep squats. You feel a little bit of burn in your, in, in your legs as well as you're going up and down. Damn, my thighs okay. feel like lead. I don't know why. Oh, <laughs> okay. We're just over halfway, so we're going really nicely. Just keep that going. Keep the old up and down movement going. Really good. Keep it nice and firm in the, in the stomach as well. So you're just holding the position. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. And stop. There we go. Okay. Right. Finding my chair again. (laughs) I think I got about 11. Did anyone do better than 11? I totally lost count. I don't think I'm able to do exercise (laughs) and think at the same time, it seems. Maybe you just did so many that it it wasn't worth counting after a while. (laughs) Yeah, maybe I was just lightning fast. Yeah, you're absolutely right. (laughs) Eleanor? Are you going to admit your score? Well, I, I did some, and then and then I decided that it was awfully hard work, and so I, I have actually got some biscuits out instead, so I apologise. Um. <laughs> oh, wow. I was going to tell you off, but I just I just have to admire that. That was, that was excellent. Um, Jess, what about you? Yeah, yeah, I got to uh, 18, but I was trying to get real d- deep as well. <laughs> wow. Well, I think I'm going to give you a little round of applause there, because um, that was certainly a lot better than... Uh, than my than my 11. Um, Dan, can I ask you about warming up? Because forum user Carl89 has recently weighed in on a discussion on our Naked Scientist forum asking actually what the point of warming up is. And he reckons it's due to increasing blood flow and enhancing flexibility of muscles. Is that right? And if we're talking about warming up, does the external temperature matter? Yeah, this is this, this is a great question, but it's also one of those questions which opens up a can of worms. If we take, for example, doing cardiovascular exercise, then the whole notion of doing a warm up for that kind of exercise is to absolutely raise temperature. But what we're trying to do is raise the temperature at which the cellular processes are operating because all cellular processes work at an optimal temperature. So if we can get those processes 
increase, the temperature increases, the rate at which those processes operate is sped up and we become more efficient. It's also designed, those kind of warm-ups, to reduce what we call an oxygen deficit. And whenever we start to exercise, what you perhaps feel for the first few minutes, the exercise always feels very hard. You feel like you're struggling to breathe and, and so on. And that's because the cardiovascular system, the aerobic supply of energy, our kind of use of carbohydrates are all delayed. They don't hit their instantaneous, um, what we call steady state. So you borrow energy from sources which we refer to as being anaerobic. And, and really the consequence of that is that's what makes it feel hard to, to exercise. So if you can warm up beforehand, what the warm up does is it raises things like your heart rate. It raises your respiration rate. It raises the metabolic rate. So when you actually get into doing the, the exercise that you really want to do, there's less of a lag. And so you get the you, you actually hit that steady state more, more effectively. The flip side to all of this is what about warming up for sports or, or exercises like strength training? Because in those sports, there is no benefit at all in doing anything which is cardiovascular based because the exercise that you're going to do doesn't stress the cardiovascular system. So in those kind of exercises, what we suggest to us to do is what is called post-activation potentiation. It's a very fancy term, isn't it? But in essence, what it's about is preparing the neuromuscular system. And if we can prepare the neuromuscular system, what we can do is recruit more what we call motor units. And the motor units are basically how many muscle fibers are recruited from a, from a nerve. And the more muscle fibers I can recruit from a nerve, the more force or therefore the more load in the gym I can lift. We don't have to, in that instance, worry about temperature. We don't have to worry about heart rate and we don't have to worry about kind of the flexibility issues. So it's, it's, it's very different. It depends on the sport that we're going to work with. You talked about the environmental temperature. If the external environmental temperature is cold, as we're starting to get now, then the warm up doesn't need to be more intense. But what it needs to do is be sufficiently stressful. And what I mean by that is putting a strain on the, on the biological system to raise the temperature enough to ensure that we, we've hit that kind of required point for the exercise. So it will take longer to warm up in colder conditions. Dan, we'll come back to you in a bit. Thank you very much for getting our blood pumping. Now, from us 21st century people moving to how our forebears did it, on our People on the Move show, we heard about science challenging our understanding of when our earliest ancestors moved out of the African continent. This traditional idea of this, you know, uh, exodus out of Africa at around 50,000 years ago isn't entirely correct. There is growing both, you know, archaeological and fossil evidence to suggest that we dispersed out of Africa earlier, all the way to, you know, northern Australia by around about 65, 70,000 years ago. The picture is just becoming much more complex. We, it appears that we left multiple times, that there were dispersals back into Africa. It's adding to this much more complex picture. That was Matthew Stewart from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology talking in particular reference to these amazing findings of what they reckon are homo sapien footprints in an ancient former lake in Arabia. Emma, let's go back to you. What is the broad picture as we now understand it about how our ancient ancestors came to move around the world? As was mentioned in that clip, for a while we thought that we didn't really spread out of Africa, which is where we first evolved, until relatively recently, by which we mean 50,000 years ago. But actually, we're getting various lines of evidence showing that humans did spread out of Africa much earlier than that. But the question is, how permanent were those migrations. So we've got some early modern human remains, for example, in Greece now, dated to 210,000 years ago. So sort of four times as old as we were thinking before. But there's no other evidence then for some time. So perhaps these are early dispersals that aren't successful colonisations. Wow, that's an incredibly long time ago. It's kind of boggling my brain a little bit. But how do our modern ancestors, Homo sapiens, how do they end up on different continents? Because I guess there's, I mean, just walking places. But what if you've got a massive water in the way? Yeah, humans get remarkably early to, for example, Australia, where some of the earliest evidence now is dating to 65,000 years ago. And of course, there's multiple large bodies of water to cross to get there from mainland Asia. So we assume that they must have had 
watercraft of some sort. We don't have any evidence of that, though. Presumably they were made of organic material, so haven't preserved. And any depictions of watercraft only come much later. But it's really the only plausible explanation for getting to parts of the world like Australia. What about the Americas? We used to think that humans only really got to the Americas perhaps about 10,000 years ago or a little more. And they got there crossing from Siberia over a land bridge that was there at the time. However, some of the evidence that we're now getting suggests that those dispersals might have been much earlier. There was a recent study of evidence um, from Mexico that was dated to 26,500 years ago. Now, one of the routes that we originally thought people must have taken was down this so-called ice-free corridor. So at that time, the land bridge was covered in ice sheets. And there were certain times when kind of an, a corridor opened up that people could have walked down. But given that we've now got these quite early dates, another hypothesis is that people actually went along the coastline. Once you've got humans all over the world, what about when people start to settle? Do we know much about the transition between having a more kind of hunter-gatherer lifestyle and when you start doing things like farming, agriculture? Yeah, we do. And there's some really interesting evidence, again, coming from the archaeology, but supplemented with ancient DNA particularly, to really understand what these processes were like. So, for example, in um, Europe and Asia, the domesticated plants and animals that people come to rely on as farmers came from an area called the Levant, Southwest Asia. For a long time, there was a big debate, was this moving into Europe by diffusion or was it actually farmers moving from the Levant and actually migrating into Europe, bringing their farming techniques with them? The genetic evidence has been showing us some really interesting things. So it does suggest that actually there was a, a migration of people into Europe. And in some places, they almost completely replaced the existing hunter-gatherer populations there. There was a study of remains um, from the UK, and it suggested that perhaps 90% of the original hunter-gatherer population was replaced by these incoming farmers. What about the other hominins that were around at the time? Because we're not just talking about Homo sapiens, are we, really? If you'd have asked that question 20 years ago, we'd have said, well, it was just modern humans and there were then Neanderthals in Europe and Asia and maybe another species called Homo erectus still in Asia. But there's been really incredible discoveries over the last 20 years. So we now have another species called Homo floresiensis that survived to about 50,000 years ago. There's also Homo luzonensis on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Homo naledi still around at about 230,000 years ago in Africa. We've got then the Denisovans, this kind of enigmatic species that were identified only initially from DNA in mainland Asia. And then we've also got evidence that Homo erectus were indeed still around in parts of Asia, um, like Java, until around 110,000 years ago. So, yeah, when we're looking at that initial dispersal period, Europe and Asia and Africa were occupied by a whole range of species closely related to us. And it's only much more recently that we've become the only ones that are left. So there's far more to hominin movement than just Homo sapiens then. Emma Pomeroy, thanks ever so much. Now, Eleanor, as it's getting quite chilly here in the UK now and we're well and truly heading into winter, this question sort of jumped out at me. Listener Dave, he says he was reading an article about horses in the Arctic protecting the permafrost and was wondering if Arctic horses migrate like caribou and other Arctic animals. The study that he's talked about, so cool, essentially using horses to protect permafrost because permafrost is kept at around about minus 10 degrees and then the snow is kind of insulating it to stop it from getting too cold, weirdly, um, as the air temperature is around minus 40 degrees. So if you put a bunch of horses in that area, they churn it up and they reduce the temperature of the permafrost, kind of protecting it, which is really interesting. And so whether or not they'd migrate. Now, this is an excellent question because actually pretty much all of the horses that we think about when we think about wild horses in Australia, in America, they're actually feral horses that have been released. So the domesticated horses have been released into the wild and have kind of adapted to it. And actually, 
we don't really know whether or not they would migrate. So there have been a little bit of work done on some of the feral populations of horses, and they do move around a bit depending on conditions around them. However, what is unclear is whether or not in a wide open space they would migrate because a lot of the populations now are kind of quite penned in, perhaps is the wrong word, but they have a limited distance which they can travel. So it might be the case that actually we're seeing no migration because they are not able to migrate, or it could be that they don't migrate. So it's a, it's a really good question to which there's not a really clear answer. Very interesting, though. Thanks for telling us about that, Eleanor. From animal movement to elite performance now, and we'll be hearing from exercise scientist and Paralympian Dan Gordon in a moment. But before that, a question in the collective consciousness recently has been around footballers heading the ball and consequences for their brain health. Last year, Glasgow University published research showing that professional footballers were three and a half times more likely to die from neurodegenerative disease. And now scientists want to build on this research with a long-term study that looks at people's brains over time. With evidence that women experience more concussion than men in the sporting world, what does this mean for women footballers and the risks associated with heading a ball? Well, Michael Gray is leading this study at UEA. Michael, what actually is the link between heading a football and brain disease? So we think that heading a ball causes something called subconcussive trauma. So if we take concussions, for example, a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. It has a number of symptoms like headache, dizziness, feeling like one is in a fog. And that's occurring because of a direct result of damage to the neurons in the brain. A subconcussive insult occurs because we're getting a bit of a lesser hit that doesn't cause a full-blown concussion, but there is still damage. And the idea is that by heading balls day after day, year after year, the neurodegeneration that builds up in the brain eventually leads to dementia. How do you know this? What evidence have we got at the moment? Most of the direct evidence will come from animal models, typically in in mice and rats. One can induce a head injury of different kinds. One can look at the behavior of the animal and then we look at the brain and we can actually see tau proteins In the brain, we can see amyloid proteins in the brain, and we know that there has been degeneration. So these are buildups or plaques that seem to be associated with the degeneration you get in things like Alzheimer's or dementias, is that right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So when a nerve is damaged, we have a process called Wellerian degeneration. So the nerve dies, it breaks up, and then there are components of the nerve called tau proteins or amyloid proteins that are not soluble. So they actually stick around in the neurons, they adhere to the blood supply, they stop the blood supply, and they prevent nerves from functioning, and they cause other neurons to die. Okay, so there is a pretty decent amount of evidence between the potential long-term effects of heading a football and problems with the brain. But where does the difference in sex come in? Yeah, so the difference in sex is, we think, really important and has been understudied. I mean, it is a fact that most of the studies of concussion, of sport-related neurodegeneration, they're all done in men. So one of the areas of concern for us is if you look at the statistics of dementia specifically, in the UK, 61% of the population of people with dementia are women. Now, some of that is because women live to a longer age and because it's a disease, obviously, that is more prevalent the older one gets. That explains some of it, but it doesn't explain all of the difference in that ratio. The other thing that we have to look at is concussions themselves. We know that women experience concussion to a greater extent than do men. And if we put those two things together, it just makes sense that women are more likely to sustain the effects of sport-related neurodegeneration than men. And that's why we really need to study it. If you're a betting man, do you have an idea of the mechanisms behind the sex differences? Because I guess there's physicality, but are there sort of hormonal changes that may be involved here? What's going on? If you look at the mechanism of injury, you have to think about the brain as some jelly in a bowl. If I smack the side of the bowl, the jelly inside will wobble around and the nerves that are in that jelly, that is the brain, they are damaged. Now, if we have a much stronger neck, for example, you can actually withstand that bubble of head effect and therefore there's less wobbling of the brain than if we have weaker muscles. And we know that women are on average less muscular 
than men, particularly in their necks. So that's one area. And if we look at the physiology, we think that there's an issue with women's cycles. So with the hormonal cycles, we think that women may actually be more at risk of concussion and therefore potentially the effects of neurodegeneration, depending on their cycles. How could this inform how sport is done in the future? Because I guess you can't, you can't eliminate risk, can you? I guess it must be about mitigation. No, you're absolutely right. This is all about risk mitigation. It's, it's we need to understand the risk before we can actually do something about it. And the idea here is it's about exposure to the injury in the first place. So one of the biggest things we can do is reduce exposure to heading the ball. In children, for example, I personally, I don't think young children should be heading balls. I think that we can be doing the training in a different way. We can be strengthening muscle, uh, neck muscles, for example, long before we, we start to head the ball. And we can do things like reducing the amount of heading in practice, increasing the time between practices where one might head the ball. And I think just by doing that alone, we will be making a difference. Michael Gray from UEA, thank you ever so much. Dan, let's come to you now. The current pandemic has presented quite significant practical restrictions, hasn't it, to professional athletes? Mm. What is the impact as you're seeing now or what do you reckon it might be in the near future? Because we've got things like, what, Tokyo 2021 around the corner. Yeah, and this is a really interesting question because I think there are some data now which is coming through, which is almost anecdotal, which is, is suggesting the impact. If we look, for example, to American sport and we look at the NFL, and that preseason has been massively reduced because of the global pandemic. So the teams were really unable to get the whole squads together. They had to have reduced squads. They couldn't have proper playthroughs. What started to actually happen is, one is the, the actual leagues are completely topsy-turvy, a bit like we're seeing, I suppose, in football in the UK, the leagues are topsy-turvy. But the other thing that's really started to happen is there is a, a significantly increased number of injuries, serious injuries as well which go beyond the bounds of what you would normally expect to see in a, in a competitive season. The other thing that we're starting to recognise is that when you are working with elite athletes, the whole aim of the game is to, is to get an athlete to peak, produce the optimal performance on a day. And they're all, in essence, what we call a four-year cycle to, in essence, prepare them for, for what would have been Tokyo 2020. And so suddenly the games are postponed, quite rightly, so the training has to change. So rather than going into a, a period of training, which they were building towards to get them into kind of a fine tuned physiological state and psychological state, they have to go back into what we call preparation training. What is going to be fascinating come Tokyo 2021 is, is really to be able to look and see which athletes have coped the best with this significant shift in the way in which they've had to focus training because their training cycle has been extended by a year, over a year. And I guess it depends on the sort of particular requirements of your sport. Like if you can do your sport, if you're a runner, then I can appreciate why your situation might be quite different to if you're a swimmer and you need access to a pool and, and the restrictions that go along with that. But what about sports people with different levels of mobility and disability? We've just completed a study which is in, in review at the moment where we've been looking at the impact of the first lockdown on the way in which individuals who, who are blind or visually impaired in the UK could access facilities. And we compared those to a population of individuals with normal sight. One of the things that we found was that individuals who were blind or visually impaired, there was a reduction in some types of physical activity that were being, being done. So in the general population, people were going out for more walks and they were going out to walk the dog or, or whatever they were doing. But in the blind or visually impaired population, those situations were being stymied because they hadn't got access to, for example, support workers. They hadn't got access to the facilities that would normally use. A lot of people who are blind and visually impaired were telling us that they would use public transport to go and do their physical activity. And one of the big things that was a benefit, I think, to most people who had normal sight was, of course, using things like um, online videos to, to train with, you know, these kind of campaigns to get people physically active. But what we found was people who were blind and visually impaired were unable to access these. And so they became very, very much marooned in terms of that, particularly the first lockdown period. I think we've learned a lot since then. 
There are a lot of stressful aspects to our lives at the moment, but is there evidence around psychological stress and athletic performance when it comes to elite sports people? Yeah, this is a great question. As we train, we actually impose a biological stress, but we also impose a psychological stress because of the competition we're training for. It it puts that kind of extra demand on as anxiety levels rise. Where studies have been done and they've mapped athletes, they've been able to track a series of markers. You can start to see how really the psychological well-being is affected. And these markers track things like how fatigued they are reporting, their feelings for vigor, their feelings for arousal and depression. And what we start to find is that as athletes start to become more stressed, The competition is looming. They are feeling tired from training. Their fatigue score goes up. Their score for vigor starts to go down. And their score for depression starts to go up. The job that we have as sport and exercise scientists and coaches is trying to manage that. There is no avoiding the fact that major competitions, like we've talked about the Olympics, are going to be stressful. There's a fine line between actually having some stress and some anxiety, which is beneficial, But having too much becomes detrimental to performance. And it's trying to manage those as best as we can. Dan, there are so many questions still around COVID-19 and the associated pandemic. But do we know that much about the impacts of COVID on athletes or the long haul COVID syndrome? The honest truth is we generally don't. The evidence that we've got from sports teams where they've been working with those athletes, we know certain sports were allowed to to come back into the mainstream like cricket and football was the the kind of the evidence that's coming out is that those individuals who are obviously more physically fit were more likely to not suffer from COVID. But we also have this evidence, which is as you become more physically fit, and particularly at the elite level, it actually potentially has a negative effect on our immune health. So one of the things we know is we have this situation which we call Neiman's J. Neiman's J is a a theory around immunology and exercise, but it basically states that if you are very unfit, then you are quite immune suppressed. You're more likely to get ill and catch infections and so on. But as you are moderately fit and moderately well trained, which is what we and the government are always trying to push for, actually, you you are able to cope more with with illness and infection. We catch less less colds and, and so on. But at the elite level, because of this stress that we've just been talking about being imposed on the body, both physically and emotionally, it imposes immune stress on the system and we become more susceptible to colds and illnesses and so on. So some of the thinking really is that it is it is likely that athletes, had they not gone into lockdown and, and isolated, would have been far more susceptible to COVID. They would have probably recovered better because they don't have the underlying health symptoms, but may have been more susceptible to catching COVID because of being immune suppressed to start with compared to the general population. Fascinating stuff. Dan Gordon from Anglia Ruskin University. Thank you very much. And we've just got time to squeeze in one more question from our resident animal expert, Eleanor Drinkwater. We're going to fly up high now because Alex says, suppose a fly were to follow a person entering the world's tallest building to the highest point. Would the fly's flight be affected by extreme height? things that high altitude might affect an animal or particularly a fly, the kind of things that spring to mind are low oxygen levels, temperature, so particularly small insects find it difficult to kind of thermoregulate, so temperature might be a really big one. The higher you go, essentially, the harder an insect would have to work in order to be able to keep flying. I don't know whether or not um, the tallest building in, in the world would be tall enough to cause a fly any problems. It might depend on the fly, but there are some insects that it would definitely be no problem at all for. So, for example, you get some bumblebees that are incredibly well adapted in order to live particularly at high altitudes. They do forage kind of in the mountains, but when they took them into the lab to test just how high they could fly, they changed the air pressure to the equivalent of around about 9,000 metres, taller than the height of Everest, which is just quite extraordinary. Remarkably, they found that they were 
totally fine. All they did was they shifted the way that they flew. So they didn't flap more because that would be unenergy efficient. Instead, they kind of drew a wider arc with their wing in order to give themselves more lift, which they reckon is probably an adaptation which they've developed to allow themselves to uh, carry lots of uh, pollen and, and nectar. But actually, it's also a really useful way of being able to deal with high altitudes as well. So if it's an alpine bumblebee, it definitely wouldn't be a problem at all. That is amazing. (laughs) Thanks very much. (laughs) I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Thank you to all of our guests. You've heard from Dan Gordon, Emma Pomeroy, Eleanor Drinkwater, Jess Johnson, Michael Gray and Gillis O'Brien Tear. Next week, with an eye on World AIDS Day on the 1st of December, we'll be taking a closer look at the disease. Where did it come from? Why has it been so hard to combat? And what's the state of things today? The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University's Institute of Continuing Education and is supported by Rolls-Royce. Until next week, goodbye from me, Katie Haler, and the rest of the Naked Scientists. 